Traveling along at 60 miles an hour Avoiding all the flashy shining cars All were dashing quickly to and fro It was then I noticed a man upon the road With his guitar and his bedroll I began to wonder where he was going Travelling man, travelling man You keep on travelling on the road Going through life all on your own Sometimes you must get very weary Hello again and welcome to the Vision Channel I'm Ron Jones my special guest today is Jeff Coombs, who is a successful businessman and who is a committed Christian. But that has not always been the case in his life, as you will find out as he and I chat together. Good morning, Jeff, and welcome to the Vision Channel. Glad you've made the journey up to chat with me today. Now, I understand that you were born in a, a small Dorset town and your parents were divorced when you were quite young. What effect did that have upon your childhood days? Well as I remember vaguely I was sent to live with my grandparents and my father um, stayed there when he was around. Yeah. Um, but shortly after that I mean and life was as far as I remember not too bad. Yeah. But it changed when my father got married again when I was five years old. Yes. Um, and then Did you go to live with your father? Uh, my father went, moved back to live with his parents, so I lived with them. Oh, so you, you actually lived a little bit under the influence of your grandparents? Absolutely. Right. Which happened quite a lot through my life, actually. Yeah. So. Now, y you were put into care, and uh, how, how did you cope with that exactly? Seven years old I was put into care, yes. When my father married again when I was five, Yeah. Um, life became pretty horrific at that point. Um, my stepmother um, was the epitome of the wicked stepmother. Yes. As much as she beat me regularly, and I, the more I was beaten, the worse I got. I Did you deserve beating, do you think? <laughs> All right, we'll skip that. Uh, yeah, I suppose so. Um, <laughs> I, it, it became self-fulfilling, I think. You <laughs> yes. know, um, um, <laughs> because I was told that I got it, for, even when I could prove I didn't do it, yeah. it was for what I'd got away with. So, <laughs> You know, I accepted that. And well, I'll have to work on that idea. It sounds good. <laughs> uh, how did you cope in the care centre then? Well, care was wonderful, really. I still got beaten for yeah. breaking the rules and things. But life was very different. It wasn't a regular, everyday beating. Um, the guy who ran the care centre was very um, much of, of involving us and letting us get on and, and, and explore our talents. He actually did try and get us to step outside of the mould, I suppose. Yes. He did try and break the mould. He didn't have too much joy, but he must have done. Yeah. At some point, I... But he used to go home from time to time. Every summer holidays, and all school long holidays, we were allowed to go home. And resume the beating process. Absolutely, I, exactly. Um, this, we're back, yes. back to the bosom of my family. <laughs> <laughs> now we come to something a bit more exciting. You were bright enough to win a scholarship into a direct grant school. What subjects did you, were you good at? I was, I was exceptionally good at English. Were you? Yes, really good at English. Yeah. Um, I barely got through in maths and Latin. But, uh, they, were, they, they were crosses I bore at the time, you know. <laughs> yes. But uh, I think really what I was good at was sports. What, t tell me about your sporting career then. Well, I, um, when I, my first sort of n knowledge that I had an ability in sport was athletics. I was a sprinter, yeah. and I yeah. and I started winning everything that I entered in. Um, I really suppose I'd had a, I'd learned to that point that you didn't lose. So I um, started being an athlete, and then I started boxing and playing rugby, and I represented the I represented Dorset boxing and the southwest of England boxing and at rugby. Um, I. And in a lot of ways, I became the big fish in the small pond. You did know? you? Um, what position did you play in rugby? I was a loose head prop. Were you? Although in, as my, in my youth, I was a centre. The, but the loose head prop is, is, a, good place, up in is a good place for a thug. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Did, did you play cricket at all? I did play cricket, but although I was not a star at it, but I did play cricket and I represented at various places for it. Now, Jeff, you told me this, that you were a thug and uh, you enjoyed hurting people, something I find difficult to understand. How old were you when y y you felt that kind of thing building up and what, what effect did it all have on your character? Well, I think I started fighting at sort of sort of six, seven years old. I mean, that was the norm in the area. We fought. We, although we were a small market town in the country, we had our gangs. And yeah. We, we fought against the next street and things. And I, I'd always run with older boys anyway. Yeah. Um, so I, I fought and I, and I enjoyed fighting. I mean, some of the stuff we did was quite violent, even by modern standards. Yeah. No. Yeah. Let me stop you a minute. You're a you're a thug. You're a fighter. Now I'm going to suggest to you that you didn't win every fight. What did you do when you lost the fight? I waited till I could get them on, on on my terms and won the fight. What do you mean on your terms? Well, I waited till it was dark and they walked by alleyways and uh, or um, they weren't expecting me because I didn't care when I fought. Now what what you just told me, I can understand why it can be said of you that you were completely out of control by the time you were 14 years of age. What exactly do you mean by being out of control? Well, there was nothing left to actually stop me doing what I wanted to do. If you were going to get a hiding anyway, did it matter what you did? There was no, there was no restrictions, no barriers. Uh, I, went, I was drinking by then. I was going to the pub and having a few beers. Um, not excessively but certainly I was having beers and going into pubs because pubs were good places to have a fight at the end of the night you could have a fight oh, everybody okay. fought in the pub afterwards but I made a point of going to the pub and selecting my targets you left school when you were 15 years of age and you became an apprentice blacksmith H how did you cope with that kind of thing and what success was Well my father decided that I wasn't allowed to do my any examinations. I was 15 years old, I was a working class boy, you're going to go to work. So he apprenticed me as a blacksmith and I started to learn to shoe horses and to make wrought iron work and, and do agricultural work in a blacksmith shop. That, that sort of built up your muscles for a bit more Maybe even bigger and stronger <laughs> than I was before. Maybe a bigger thug than I'd set out to be. You know. Now, ju just as a sideline, tell me a little bit about your exploits as a poacher. Um, poaching became a sort of a way of life because if I had any money, my parents removed it from me. So I found other ways of making some money. And I would go and poach for trout and salmon and pheasants on various estates around the area. <laughs> I, used, I, I always carried a rabbit wire in my pocket, yeah. um, but I didn't use rabbit wires for rabbits. Now, I understand, Jeff, that you, you, your next job uh, was a runner in uh, a clay mine. Th that word runner intrigued me because I've always associated with uh, bookies. Well, I don't think it's not bookies, but it certainly was a bet because we had to get a certain number of, of wagons out each day to get any wages. Yeah. And my job was to take the loaded wagon from the, f from the clay face and run it from the clay face back to the uh, railway point where it was taken to the surface because we were in drift mines driven through the side of the hills. Yes. And uh, I might have to run a mile with that with 13 and a half hundred weight in that. Uh, that all building up your muscles yeah. for That's more right. thuggery. And if it came off the rails, I had to actually pick it back up. 13 and a half hundred weight at sort of 16 years old tends to make you a bit strong even though it was a technique to it. Yes. Now, at, at 17 years of age, your life took uh, quite a big change of direction and you joined the Royal Marines. What effect did that have upon your life and what effect did it have upon your character going into the Royal Marines at 17? Well... It took me out of my environment straight away, which was a, a wonderful, and put me amongst a lot of young men, which involved me in a lot more thuggery, needless to say, because uh, we were all establishing our position on the, in the pecking order, coming from all parts of the country. Some of us couldn't even speak the same language, even though we spoke English. Yeah. Um, and we, I still fought. Uh, but I think what the Royal Marines did is they, they gave me 
some sort of discipline and responsibility to a family that I didn't think I knew anything about before. Yes, yes the Royal Marines became family. Yes. Um, the more we chat, the more convinced I am that you were a thug. Um, what, what, what made you join the commandos? Uh, was it your love of thuggery? I just, I, I don't know so much about love of thuggery. I think it was the glory image. You know, I was going to be able to do these things legally. And, and I mean, I'd read all the books and seen all yeah. of the pictures of, pe of the heroes and the commandos and all the rest. And I actually lived near a Royal Marine base in Paul. So I knew about them anyway. Yeah. Uh, and when one joined the Royal Marines at that point, um, it was command all commandos, all Royal Marines became commando service. Now, now uh, I'd, I'd like to know just a little bit about uh, the time when I think you told me you were hunting down communist terrorists. I think it was in Malaysia. Um, were, were you involved in jungle warfare in that period yeah. in your life? And what, what, how, would you, how would you describe what jungle warfare is? Yeah, that's right. We, were, uh, we did some jungle warfare training in Singapore, yeah. which was sort of through... Uh, at the t what I at the time thought was jungle, and I found out very quickly was not jungle. Um, but I, we then were sent up onto the Thai border to hunt down the yeah. remaining communist terrorists that from the Malay emergency. And uh, I, in my early days in Singapore, in the first few months, had taught myself to speak Malay. Yes. So I uh, was a actually put with um, bounty hunters they, who were ex-communist terrorists who were hunting... Who Rather than go to prison, they decided they'd work for the British and hunt their own. Yeah. And we went into the jungles to hunt for them. And it was there that I learnt what jungle warfare was really about. Yes. These guys taught me how to survive in the jungle. Yes. Um, did you have some near squeaks? Yeah, well, near squeaks was sort of what life was about. It was <laughs> adrenaline. Yeah. I mean, I wanted to be involved in all the fighting that was going on. Made the adrenaline. Yeah, as much as there was, it was there, I wanted to be part of yeah. it. Yes. When uh, the conflict in Indonesia started, I understand you were sent to Borneo, where you, you worked with a tribe of, in quotes, headhunters. Yep. Uh, tell me something about that and the experience that you had. Well, be, um, the, the Royal Marines were, base, were sent over into Borneo yeah. to, to be involved in this conflict, and I... Um, because I spoke Malay, yeah. became involved with the with the local population more, and the government had no, I don't know if it's, whether the government, but it had been decided by powers that be that uh, the Ebans would be good guys to have with us. Yes, um, and I got involved with them and, and that, started leading that, patrols. That word that you use, something or other, it meant headhunters, did it? That's correct. It was the a e tribe of headhunters. Iban e were headhunters. Right. Albeit, albeit headhunting had been made illegal. Yeah. And all of a sudden there was a war on. So it became legal again. Well, unofficially. Or, or unofficially legal. Mm. Now, uh, was, it, was it in that situation that you were ambushed? That's correct. Tell yeah. me about being ambushed then. Well, ambush in the jungle is a very different situation than the normal ambush you would tend to hear about or not. When you're ambushed in the jungle, you've got three or five seconds to live. Um, if you survive that first three to five seconds, you've got a chance of surviving because people are shooting at you from 10, 15 feet away in that type of ambush. If you're in an explosive ambush, it's a different story altogether. But yeah. in, a, in an ordinary sh shooting ambush, they are very near to you. And yes. the drill is you turn, you run straight at them. Yeah. Were you in more than one ambush? The no, I, I mean, I only got uh, caught once, fortunately. Yeah. But we, um, when the guns fired, we turned and ran straight at them. Now, I understand that when you were in that situation, you cried out to God. And in actual fact, God had no place in your life at all. No, Sounds the, crazy. The only connection I'd had with God was church parades. Yeah. Um, where it was compulsory to attend church or um, whilst I was overseas, uh, we went to Christian, if we knew there were Christian homes around, we went to them because they would feed us. Yeah. I mean, that was the only connection I had with church. Now, now we have established the fact that you were a thug. Did you cry out to God because you were a frightened thug? 
I think that's probably true. Um, I think most people, when one's faced with a situation like that, no one wants to die. And all that one. and you, and I don't know, I think most servicemen ha have some acceptance that there is a being of power above them. But I don't know, at that point, I remember quite clearly saying, please yes. God. In the mid-60s, you got married. And at the same, in the same period, you became a member of the Special Forces Unit. And ca can you tell me if there was any strain upon your marriage with it? I was uh, in the Far East and in the Middle East. Yeah. Um, at various operations there. Strain on the marriage, almost certainly. Um, I was the epitome, I suppose, of uh, a special forces secret agent. I didn't, I didn't t tell anyone anything. I didn't talk about it. I wouldn't tell my wife anything at all. So you of couldn't course, tell her where you were. No, one, she of didn't course, know where you were. No, my wife, my wife was told nothing, nothing at all. I went away and came back. Did you? Uh, how how long were you away? Well, at the sometimes time? it was sometimes it was weeks, sometimes it was months. Yeah, just I just didn't tell her anything. You didn't. You, you, she was just the wife. Yes. Well, that must that must have had a strain on your marriage because yes. it must have been a time of anxiety for her. She didn't know where you were. I think it was. And she didn't know what you were doing. No, I think it was probably horrific for her because she was a young woman taken from a Somerset town and dumped into the Far East with this guy and uh, then he walked out and did yeah. these things. Um, what would you say was the most frightening experience you had when you were in those special, that Special Forces unit? I don't think I had a frightening experience. I had total belief in my ability. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, that's the, the, the only time in Special Forces, or, I mean, in the services, full stop, where I actually can remember asking for someone or something to help me. But of course, once it was over, um, that didn't happen. No, you thought you'd what been a pretty... What happened was my skill and ability. That's right. You thought you'd been a pretty clever guy well, to get well, out was. Of the ambush well, and all the rest of it. Absolutely. Right. Now, I, I know we can't go into that any, any further. I'd, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about the contract that you had to train, I think it was Libyan naval personnel that uh, brought you into an involvement with men from the uh, Palestinian Liberation Organization. Uh, what, what, what guerrilla warfare were you involved with in that particular situation? Well, I was approached uh, after I'd left the services um, to go and take a contract in Libya to teach the Libyan naval personnel special forces activities, predominantly diving, um, covert diving. Yes. Uh, uh, what, how, would, how would you describe guerrilla warfare? Well, it's not playing by the rules that everybody else understands. When, were you, were you involved in guerrilla warfare? Yes, I was, yes. Right. Um, one fought on a basis of, of, of putting as much fear into the local p populations as possible, um, because that made your life easier. Uh, if you could intimidate people, it allowed you to do what you wanted. And guerrilla forces have always used that, in as much as the ones who can intimidate the most have the most control of what goes on, yes. therefore making your life a bit easier. Uh, certainly I would put pressure of various sorts on local people to do what I want. And one didn't fight by the rules, one fought to win. What you needed to do was win. Yeah. Rules don't enter. I mean, one's got to understand that most of these conflicts, the Geneva Convention doesn't even come into it. No. Um, they, but the enemy most certainly don't know anything about the Geneva Convention and wouldn't obey it anyway. And nor did I. I did no. what was necessary to do. Now, you, you've taken me through a number of experiences and a lot of your involvements. Uh, up, up to now, it, it, it seems that just about every involvement you had involved hurting people. There, Is, I mean, am, I, am I right? You're absolutely right, Ron. I, I mean, I liked the exhilaration and the fear of danger, um, albeit fear in small letters and inverted commas. Yeah. I mean, I liked the adrenaline kick. It was great. And I mean, 
there was certainly a great exhilaration in, in, in exerting my supremacy over other people, both, yeah. both in conflict and in my normal social life. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm going to ask you a very personal question, and if you don't want to answer it, say I'd rather not. Um, did, uh, did you get a kick? Uh, out of kind of deliberately hurting people. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You did. I mean, a, a real high. Then there was the time when you got married again, and uh, you were involved in commercial diving, which uh, took you to all parts of the world. Was it during that period that you ran out of air at about, was it 130, 150, 150 feet, feet and um, your reserve supply failed. Yeah, that's right. I was, how, I was, how did you feel? Um, I was working in the Southern North Sea and yeah. uh, I ran out of there at about 150 feet and I pulled the reserve and it didn't. there was no reserve and I had no problems, I had no worries about it because um, I had been trained how to get out of that situation to what's known as a free ascent come up with the air that was in the lungs because it expands and I started to do that and then I hit a beam on the web because I was actually working on it a uh, beam yeah I was what kind on of beam a steel beam yeah I was working on what's known as a jacket rig jackets are uh, rigs where they're piled into the seabed and there's cross members to, to support and strengthen the rig yeah and on the way and I was been working inside of it and on the way up I hit one of these and became disorientated Realised yeah. I was swimming downwards rather than upwards. Yeah. Tried to find my way back and got in a panic. And at that point I said, please God. Again? Yeah, again. Oh, you're a jolly old fella. So, so every time you were in a real squeeze, you cried out for God and had no place at all for him in your life at that other at time. Yeah, that seems, I mean, on reflection and, and going back on my life, yeah, that seems yeah. to have been the case, you know. You were a bit of a rogue as well as a thug, I reckon. Um, yeah. 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 Now, it, it, was it during that contract that you, you you made a lot of money? I made a lot of money over the next few years. Yes. Right. I want to ask you how much. Um, a lot of money. What, what did you do with it? Did you invest it? Or I send invested it, home it in to the, the local bars, I think. And did, uh, in what? In, in the local bars, alcohol, and so uh, you, you, living the high life. Your wife and your family had no benefit out of all that money. No, I lived the five-star lifestyle. They lived the two-star. <laughs> oh, it, get, it gets worse. Isn't it amazing, Jeff, that, that after all the, that experience that you'd gone through and making all the money, that you then ended up not even as a meat cutter, but as a trainee meat cutter? Uh, tell me about this meat cutting business well it got to the i mean i'd been overseas and doing various jobs and then i came back and Anne and i had had um some serious problems in our marriage and and we'd busted up a couple of times and got back together and Anne insisted that i have a proper job and settle down so i went to get this job as a trainee meat cutter and i got it and i started reorganizing the factory <laughs> now tragedy struck and your wife was taken seriously ill I, I think it was a case of cancer yeah um, I was I'd been in the company a few years and I'd progressed to um, production manager of the company and uh, Anne became run down Anne was working as a, as a midwife to a pig farmers she yeah. was delivering baby pigs all the time and she became run down, mouth ulcers, constantly tired, and I told her to go and see the doctor, and she wouldn't, and in the end I told her to get on with the doctor. She was diagnosed as having multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of the bone marrow cells. There she, wasn't much hope. No, they told us they couldn't cure it. All they could do was give her some treatment to, contro to try and control it. They couldn't yes. cure it at all. So we... Uh, so they gave her this treatment for uh, chemotherapy for a long period of time to try and control it. When they found they couldn't control it, they gave her a transplant of her own white cells, yeah. a stem cell transplant it's called, and sent her home. She yeah. came home very ill, wouldn't eat, wouldn't drink. I couldn't cope, had a bit of a breakdown. Yeah. And at that point I said... But then 
she was miraculously healed and and I know you went mountaineering it's very evident Jeff that you've done lots of things in your life uh, you've run risks you've had adventure you've virtually traveled the world uh, you can almost name it and Jeff Coombs has done it and your life has taken various directions and then came a moment when the greatest direction change took place in your life in a minute or so tell me what happened well at that point I realized there was more in life than what there is now and it was at, my, at that time I found, found Jesus Christ into my life and I accepted him totally as my savior and my lord and master did it make a radical change Jeff? overnight I stopped swearing immediately yeah my attitude to life changed drastically our marriage started to improve and life became much better all around. A lot of the stress fell away and I started to live life as I know it should be lived. How many years ago was that? Four years this month. Four, four years this month. Four, about four years Right, this week. And, and now I know that you're heavily involved in uh, Christian work. Now I, I want to just take, we, we've got about a minute and a half left I think, uh, a little quote of yours. I have learned that the power of love is greater than the power of the sword and I have learned that obedience to the Lord brings its own reward. Jeff, how did you learn those lessons and what effect have they, you're learning the lesson, what effect has it had upon your daily life? I think really when I first became a Christian I still did it my way, yeah, but uh, it didn't work too well. And I met some people who have been Christians a long time, and they um, took an interest in me and cared for me, loved me really. I suppose. I, I mean, if that's not a word that people find strange for another man to love another man, but they really loved me and they cared for me, and they gave me a lot of advice about obedience, and, and I started to do what I was told to do by the Lord automatically without any questions. Yes, and things changed. For instance. At the end of last year, my job came to the point where I couldn't cope with it anymore and I walked away from that. Uh, having prayed to God to find me a job time and time again, and he didn't. But when I walked away from it, he filled me up. He gave me so much work. Yeah. So I ended up working for myself as a training consultant, teaching people health and safety, food hygiene. Um, and the jobs just keep seem to be coming it's in. It's terrific, with, isn't it? Yeah, the change less, that less Jesus... Stress, and it's easy. Jesus makes a difference. Every time, Jeff, I have an interview, I put one last question to everyone I talk to, and I'm going to do the same with you. What exactly does Jesus Christ mean to you, Jeff Coombs, right now as you and I chat together? Jesus Christ is inside me. He's part of me every day as I walk along. What every decision I make is made either because of him or of him. And when I fail to listen to him, I invariably find it's wrong. And you, you, you would advise people to get right with God? Absolutely. And you would say to them, it's a great life? It's the most exciting part of my life I've ever had. And you, I, I've and had some exciting times in my life. But this is the most exciting. This is a tremendous adrenaline kick. I, I agree with you, Jeff. It is terrific. It's been great to talk to you. And uh, thanks for giving the time to come today, making the journey uh, and uh, chatting to me. Pray that God will bless you and Anne in the days that lie ahead in all your service for the Master, and I'm sure he will. Once again, my sincerest thanks. God bless. Thank you, Ron. What a life. What a mess. Hurting people f simply for the kicks he would get out of it. But what a change. And it reminds me of a, the, a marvelous scripture which just says this, if any man be in Christ, if any man commits his life to Christ, he is a new creation and all the old things are passed away and everything becomes new. And if you want a living proof of that, you've just heard it. For Jeff Coombs is just that. And the amazing thing is that that change can happen to all of us, whatever our life has been like. And Christ can change it absolutely and completely. 
so goodbye for this time my thanks to Jeff again my thanks to you the viewers for having us in your home and of course my thanks to the camera crew and till next time take good care of yourself and remember this God is faithful always traveling man traveling man you keep on traveling on the road going through life all on your own sometimes you must get